Hello, everyone. I'd like to introduce Alex Tam, who is the current group CEO of Pactor. But to just give you an idea of his trajectory and uh, his tenure in the dating industry, he came to us in 2014 by starting Guy Guy as the founder CEO of Guy Guy and then joined Pactor Group. Guy Guy, I think, got acquired and then he was elevated to the CEO, group CEO role in 2020. So I'm fascinated with Pactor, I want to tell you, because this joint understanding of dating apps and matchmaking, and I think Alex's path through matchmaking into kind of a dating group, and then, you know, well, I'll let him talk. <laughs> I'll let him talk. So his topic is Beyond the Swipes, Declining Marriage Aspirations and the Future of Pactor. Alex, thank you very much. Take it away. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Let me just share my slides. Give me a second. Okay, I hope you guys can see the slide. Yeah, so good afternoon to everybody. My name is Alex and I'm based in Singapore. So it's it's a bit late right now. It's about 12.30 a.m. at this point in time. So, so I decided to share a little bit more about this topic called declining marriage aspirations and the future of Park Tour. I think over the last couple of months, there were a couple of conversations that I had uh, and they were all talking about this topic about the declining marriage and uh, whether does it affect a dating company like like we like us so i think it would be great to to share the rest about about this how how we see this topic so a little bit more about pacto so pacto it's founded back in 2013 i think as mark brought up it was founded by a founder called called joseph my partner and i started off as a dating app so Pacto in Singapore. So I joined the company in about 2015, 2014, 2015. Uh, and I started the offline dating brands. So it started off in Singapore. It's an extension of the dating app. Uh, and slowly we extended the variety of services that we provided from an offline point of view. So we do one-to-one -one matchmaking. We do LGBT matchmaking. Across the different countries that we do, we do dating events. Uh, and uh, some of the clients we see... Uh, they may need more than uh, matchmaking. We also do image consulting uh, and a couple of deals that we do with our corporate sales through our database as well. So right now we run about 10 different brands from both online to offline under this Parktor group. A little bit more about the app itself. So Parktor works a little bit similar to like the likes of Tinder, Bumble. So it still has that swipe, analysm, left, dislike, right, like, and then there's a match. Uh, the key difference between our brand and a lot of the Western brands is that we are a little bit, we find ourselves a bit more localized. So even as our brand suggests Park Tor, it comes from a Cantonese word, uh, which means dating in, in, in Asia. So we see more local users uh, on, our, on our application compared to uh, the Western brands. In terms of monetization, we are operating under a freemium model. So it's free for download, free for use, limited use. Uh, and uh, once you hit the paywall, Likely it's because there's lack of, you, you, you run out of swipes or you need more filters. Yeah, so those are some of the monetization strategy that we have. Presence wise, we are mostly in Asia. Predominantly we are in Korea and Taiwan. Those are our biggest markets. We have about 20 million users right now. Age wise for this mobile app, it's younger. TAs are a bit younger, so between 18 to 35 years old. And I think that's an interesting segment that we have and as we branch off to the online, to the offline businesses. So for the offline side, I think I did mention that some of the key services that we have are personalized matchmaking. So how it really works is that clients come to us and uh, tell us about their profiles, who they are, and then we collect all this information. And now after COVID, we can also do through Zoom. In the past, before COVID, we only do in person in our physical offices in our meeting rooms. So right now we can be verify all the information and we collect what their match preference are. And then we start to help them. They, they'll buy a package from us and then we will start matching them uh, based on those preferences. Yeah, and uh, we also do image consultancy. So for those who need help in uh, getting more success on their first date, they'll come to us and we'll help them with their grooming. We'll help them with their confidence classes so we do those, those workshops on one-to-one -one as well uh, and dating events that's 
we do it about two to about two to three two to three times a month per country so that's the kind of frequency i think in the past we do even more but now after covid i think we are slowly trying to get the right balance of the events that we do so our offline wise we have about six hundred thousand uh, profiles on our site across the the, the region so majority of our profiles are in Singapore and Taiwan. And you can see that the age range is slightly older. So it starts from about 26, 25, 26, all the way to about 50 for us. Yeah, so that is the difference in the profiles. So I think this trend about the declining marriage rates is not something that is only local, only in Asia. I think it's based on our, our, our research and, and how we see this. It's always tier one cities that get sees this trends first yeah so it's something that is very interesting is that in singapore our government does uh, this surveys on a regular basis so every five years they'll try to pause the, the population and it's quite an extensive one so uh, and part of the information they collect is about single about marriage about parenthood so one thing that we see is that for young singles between age of 21 and 35 They've surveyed about 3,000 singles in, in, in Singapore alone. There has been a trend from 2012, their first, uh, I mean, their, their survey back in 2012. Uh, was about 86% of singles had the intention to marry uh, and it has decreased to about 80 in 2021. Right? So more and more singles are not looking to marry. But of course, I think the absolute percentage is still high, it's still at the 80% mark, but we can see this trend coming down. And we zoom in a little bit further among those who are single, there are those that are currently dating and those that are currently not dating. So about 50% of all the singles out there in Singapore, I mean surveyed ones, 50% of them are currently attached and 50% of them are still looking for a partner. And the interesting fact is that there are these 50% who are not currently dating, about 40% of them has never dated before. So effectively, about 20% of singles in, in Singapore, based on this sample, they have never dated before. Right? So I think this dating trend is something that we are um, trying. I mean, there's, a, there's a huge real gap down here to help singles find love. Right? So based on, based on the survey results, for those who are currently dating, why are, not, why are they not getting married? I, I think these are some of the key reasons. The first one, Mostly it's because uh, they, they are less and less inclined to have kids. I think this is a very real problem in, in a country like Singapore and Taiwan. I actually Hong Asia, mostly Asia. Um, you can see that uh, the, the population growth rate actually decreased, less and less kids being, uh, the birth rate is decreasing, right? So because of that, I think they have less reason to get married. The other reasons are quite a few of them are financial in, in nature, too expensive, couldn't afford to get married at this point in time, so on and so forth. Right? And for those who are not currently dating, main two reasons are still lack of channels and no, not, not enough opportunities for them to find somebody that they like. Right? So those are the two, two key reasons. Right? So with all this, I think for, for our company, I think there are a few attempts on how to tackle this situation about less and less people wanting to get married. Right. So I think the first step that we are trying to take is to diversify our products type. So, and also to integrate these different products together. Right. So in terms of our approach to this is that first we want to have more services and secondly, to integrate all these services together, right. To make this a positive experience. Uh, so first thing, how we enter into the market is usually through our dating app, right. That's, we will try to get more users, the first batch of users in each of the markets that we enter into, right? And then after that, we'll also then insert an offline team in those markets that we have to start monetizing those who are more keen to, to find a partner or sooner they, they, are, they are more keen to settle down earlier, right? And uh, we try to connect these two services together uh, in this ecosystem by integrating them, such as, for example, on the dating app, they will see some of the events that we want to organize for, for those for the particular city, right? So uh, advertising events, giving them opportunities instead of just swiping, they'll see upcoming events around the region. We can also uh, offer services for those uh, singles on our dating app, right? To try, for example, go for one of our classes, go for one of the workshops to improve on the skills, conversation skills and app, things like that. 
right? And with each of the markets that we set up, we also try to link them up. So there are clients that comes in, come on board with us in Singapore or, or dating app user in, from Singapore. And as they travel through the different countries that we have, they will still be able to use our services, whether it's online or, or, or offline, for example, joining uh, uh, overseas even. Right, that's just possible with us. Right, so another way of how we are interconnecting our services, for example, uh, we have image consultants that use our dating app as a tool to evaluate whether this person has improved. For example, homework for this client is to say find ten matches right before the next session they, they come to to our coach. Right, so so that is also a way that we can cross sell our different products. We also have coaches. Because we have access into the online database, we know that some of them have very low match rates. We can introduce a coach to help them. Or we find that they are not very successful, not very, do not get a lot of right swipes. We can also introduce a, a, a relationship manager to help them try offline channel, a one-to-one a -one matchmaking service, which maybe they have not even thought about prior to uh, downloading the dating app. Yeah. Now the types of events that we do, again, I, we are trying to make it a bit more fun for our for singles, we're trying to make it a little bit more light. So price point for our events are a lot lower than personalized one-to-one -one matchmaking. So for example, before COVID, we have bigger dating events. So in 2017, we have like, we booked down the whole aquarium. We have about 250 singles that comes into this event which is quite nice. We also do a collaboration with Time Out. We do a pure blind matchmaking event back in 2019. There was also very well received events. More recently, 2023, after the COVID period, we had a collaboration with the local government in Taiwan. So they put, they put in quite a bit of singles in at a public area that we had access to. And we do some dating events over there, dating activities over there. November 23, we also had, in partnership with one of the local hotels, we brought in 50 singles, 20, 25 dogs. So it's a pet dating event. And it was very well received for the younger crowd. I think they find it very interesting. Not just matchmaking the, the humans, but they're also matching their dogs at the same time during at this particular event. Yeah, so, so that was quite a good spin. And I think the ticket break was pretty interesting. Another part of diversification, I think it's market expansion. So I think we've been expanding into the different cities within the country. We are now also expanding into the different new countries that has presence by the dating app. So a new country that we recently tried entering into in 2023 is Korea. We had the dating app in there for the past six, seven years already. We only just recently started to establish an offline brand there. Another two new markets that we are also going to beta test this year, Thailand, as well as Greater Bay Area in China. Yeah. So, so with all these markets being set up, we are also trying to establish something called a day passport, which we really have, but with more points, it allows, with more locations, it allows singles to be able to date regionally. They can buy five dates from a particular country and utilize them across the region. We also embrace inclusivity. I think that's a strategy approach that has been pretty well so far. We started an LGBT business back in 2018 when LGBT marriage was being legalized during a period of time. We set up a, a team of about 10, 15 people running different events on ground to build this community. So right now we're the largest LGBT, actually we are the largest gay matchmaking business in Taiwan. And I mean, we do participate in a lot of those pride parades. And I think so far, this community has been supporting this gay matchmaking brand quite well in Taiwan. And we are also hoping to, to push this brand further out into other countries as well. We are also trying to go beyond first date. That's also something that we hope to touch I and mean, reach out to singles potential singles and also to, to extend this value chain for, for the singles as well. So I think in the past, we have been very much focused on helping them find the first date, whether it's the dating app or whether it is the offline brands that we have. We recently in 2023 started to partner with this new company. So they have been a platform where they list a lot of uh, different activities for couples, right? So we are we have tried to work with them 
where as long as we have a couple that we set up from whether is it, I think for this trial uh, in 2023 was mostly for the offline brands. So as long as we have two singles who are a match, went on their first date and they like each other, we got them to, to this platform and asked them and give them credits for them to try to go on more dates through this list of activities that they have. So through this platform called Sparks, I think the, the response was pretty well. I think they, they like that we have another way for, for them to go on more dates. Uh, and it's also a good point for us to get more data about whether our users are continuing in this relationship. So ideally, if they continue to use Sparks, we will, we will be able to tell that they are still in their relationship. This is a piece of information that's quite hard for us in the past to be able to continue to, to get the pulse. Yeah. So 72% of the, of the couples that attended the events uh, had a positive experience. Uh, we have not rolled this out onto our uh, app yet, uh, but I think it's something that once we establish the, the right setup, I think we would also consider doing that. In the space of dating, we also find that there's a lot of gifts that move across the singles. So we also started a gifting brand in-house, right? So it's also a trial. This brand is called After Flame. We have done a bit of research and realized that homeware series is, is quite popular to be a gifting kind of category. So we created some candles, we created some coasters. And what we wanted to do is that when singles come to us and buy a service with us, uh, and after each date, we will surprise the date with a gift that they have pre-purchased with us. So this is also an attempt that we started in 2022. There was some pretty good take up at the start. I think we're still trying to fine tune the product. I think that that's, that's the, I think the concept is okay. I think the product is something that we're trying to improve along the way. Yeah. But this is also something that we have tried and possibly this is also another new touch point for singles, right? To know about this entire ecosystem of Park Tour. Maybe this time their entry point is through a brand called Afterflip. So, to, so to, to sum it so far, I think there is this declining marriage rate, but I think our approach to it is a lot to do with making dating easier, making dating more integrated, more inclusive, and I think more importantly, I think more fun. And I think that that's where we are coming in from. So from, from this survey that they have done, the same survey that they have done by, by the local government, Singapore government, I think they also have found that the biggest growth in channels for singles to find a partner uh, is still these uh, three key channels, which are all online, right? Online, uh, uh, online apps, online web dating sites, uh, and also dating agencies as well. So I, I think with this set of information, I think it's still a good sign that people are still uh, exploring beyond their social circles to find uh dating products to help them search uh, in terms of channels. And I think what the, the, the key thing that we want to do from uh, Pactos point of view is to make it uh, uh, attractive for them to choose us uh, as the service provider to get them uh, to find a potential partner. And whether, whether they eventually get married or not, I think um, that is, that is not, not the primary concern at this point and for, for, for us. I think it's to help them find their, their, their potential partner. With that, I think that that's all I have for today. Open up for any questions that you guys have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you for sharing. To your final point, um, that was one of the things, as you were saying, the, the, the marriage in inclination is declining. I was like, okay, but is that really bad? And should we meddle with that? Is that really the end goal? Uh, are people really less inclined to be in a social construct of some form? Is, it, is, is the concept of marriage in decline? Or is the concept of not being single in, in decline? Well, I'd be wor more worried about the latter. <laughs> you know? Yeah, people exactly. are inclined to not be single. I just want to ask that question because it kind of builds on that last point that you made. Right. So I think from a business point of view, that is exactly true what Mark said. I think we are focused on trying to find 
uh, help singles find a potential partner, whether this relationship ends up being a marriage, I think we are less worried at this point in time. But of course, I think from a bigger point of view and in a more societal point of view, um, there's still a lot of infrastructure that's built on the, the notion of marriage. So for example, I think a lot of grants are being set on, on marriage and government is still trying to promote marriage as, the, as, as a healthy society kind of kind of uh, kind of setting right so but i think from business for us it, it's not not so much of that worry about whether or not they want to get married yeah gotcha okay i've got a round of questions here from our group uh so let me start with uh, mariko takioka who's the ceo of east mid east uh thrilled to have you here mariko mariko wonderful uh your question is what's the monetization model for the offline service Right. Uh, so we have quite a few service. So for the personalized one-to-one -one matchmaking, clients usually pay us upfront a fixed fee, whether is it for guarantee dates or whether is it for profile sharing that we have. So there's different model uh, and it's also price. The price is dependent on their profile and their preferences also. Yeah. So it's, it's, there, there, there is a way for us to compute it. So basically they are pre-purchasing pre certain packages with us, uh, and we are helping them fulfill it over, over say 12, 12 months or, or 18 months. But you really do have the full spectrum, don't you? You've got the coaching, you've got the, yep. you've broken it out into distinct products, which is, I've not seen that before. What I do see is a lot of matchmakers like to do the matchmaking. They come into matchmaking, wanting to do matchmaking, but ending up wanting to do coaching because the matchmaking part is really tough for the sheer inventory requirement. So yeah. the small matchmakers to come in, this is really a scale game for everybody. You need to yeah. have the inventory of people. Um, so I look at that you've got inventory because of the apps, you're attracting people into the apps and then you've got this wonderful raft of distinct services, which only makes complete sense to do. <laughs> right. So you've got the like, do you want coaching? Do you, yeah. do you want uh, image coaching? Do you want the actual yeah. coaching on an app? I mean, you've broken it up into the distinct uh, elements. So you, you can get people used to coaching, it seems. Get used to having some additional services, like this concept of help, really. And that's something that the dating industry in general hasn't cracked. It's like, okay, we'll send you some content, but we're not going to actually interact with you with a real human. <laughs> oh <my God>. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, you've got real humans interacting with your real human customers here. So okay. I want to ask you, you've got these two factions, and just to build on the monetization question, and you've got two factions of the business in general. You've got this kind of human-esque service where you've got humans talking to humans, which is the coaching and, and the matchmaking and the match and the, and the, you know, the image guidance. But then you have the online, you've got dating apps. So my, presumably your dating app business is monetized to a certain level, but you've got this back-end ARPU that you can measure. You can measure the flow all the way through the business, basically, through to matchmaking. So you've got that full picture, which is, yeah. you know, very compelling. I'd like to ask you, though, of the two factions of your business, which business, which faction, online versus offline, has the bigger revenue? And um, share whatever you feel comfortable with. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> whatever yeah, you can yeah, I think, yeah. Uh, at this point in time, offline brings more revenue. Yeah, yeah um, the, the average price is a lot higher, but in terms of volume, it's always the online side that brings in a lot more volume faster. Yeah, yeah. Try before you buy more help, basically, maybe for some right. people it's enough, right? Yeah, I just think the dating industry is missing out on what you've done here. This is really groundbreaking work. I'm looking forward to hopefully using what you've done here to inspire broader thinking. So we've got Anis here who's got a question. Anis actually is the former VP engineering from Meetup, by the way. Anis, welcome. So let me ask you a question here. If the people not dating have small social circles and or want to leave it out to chance, what do you think about focusing on social events that specifically don't focus on dating? That's the thing, yeah? Of course, coming from Meetup, right. perfect question. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that is also a very interesting point. It's so recently we did it, this, this uh, we had this issue about trying to do a dating event and uh, not enough signups. So, so that was quite a few months ago. And in, in, in this process of trying to get people to join this event, uh, we tried another whole new sets of ads that is just targeting and downplaying this, this terminology of dating, uh, purely socializing and the sign up for the particular group of people that we were targeting, we we're trying to reach 
actually more the younger group you were there were trying to reach actually turn out pretty well yeah so so i guess to different age group the intent and the words that we use to attract them to turn up for a particular event a social event can be different and the outcome is we want a group of people who are single to come together and we and once they're there, then the opportunity for them to find somebody, uh, it's, 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 it's then available. Yeah. So at your events, how are you doing speed dating concert format or either, is it a kind of open format? So people just bump into each other and introduce themselves. Uh, a whole white, I mean, different, different settings. Uh, some of them are sit down dating, speed dating, rotation, one-to-one. Some of them are maybe a table of five and start rotating. Some of them are activity based. They do a certain activity together in, in different groups. So I think different ways to get them to interact. I think the main thing is for the people who attend to have the chance to talk to each other. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Alex, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. This is really quite fascinating and very inspirational. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. See you soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.